because there are a lot of people that are going to be making the argument, and I'm sympathetic to the argument. doesn't mean I agree with it, but I am sympathetic to it. That the reason that that was there and the reason that people today fly the rebel flag, the Confederate flag, whatever you want to call it, even though it's, it's technically not the Confederate flag, the reason that they want it there is because it's a part of their heritage. They have pride as Southerners, they are proud of where they are, and because of that, they would like to have the flag as an emblem to represent that. Okay, I get that. You can be patriotic for your state. You can be patriotic being from the South. Believe me, I am. Born and bred in Alabama, always, I've, I've lived here my entire life. I've never lived in any place outside the state of Alabama. I've lived in Auburn for a while when I was at college. but So I've lived in different cities, but I've always lived within the state of Alabama. And I love being from Alabama. I don't shy away from it. I mean, my, my show is a dedication to Alabama state news. Obviously, it's something that's really important to me. Ultimately, what this does boil down to is a communication issue. And this is where I get to use my fancy Auburn degree that I paid thousands and thousands of dollars for. So, you know, kids, you can pay thousands of dollars for a college diploma and be able to do goofy one-off sideshows on an internet show. <laughs> That's why you get your diploma. Um, so we'll go ahead and check this out because uh, this is where my communication degree really comes in handy is that there is a, a pretty big miscommunication problem. And I'm not going to give you an entire lecture on human communication and how it works, but this is the, the long and short of it. This is the basics, and you can see there that you have the source. That's the person that wants to send the message, and then they encode the message. And the encoding process is basically from your brain to your mouth, if this is done through verbal communication. So it's, it's that process of trying to figure out how to distill what idea you want to convey and encoding it into some kind of messaging system. And then you have the transmission. The transmission is the mode of communication that you choose to use. So for example, right now, if you're watching me on the internet, then the transmission is the internet. And the transmission is my microphone. And the transmission is my soundboard and my computer and your speakers and all of those things. That's a part of transmission. In fact, this is where we get the word or the idea of media. So the medium on which we are communicating, in this case the internet, would be the form of transmission. And then once you hear that message, there is a decoding process. So you start breaking down and trying to comprehend and understand the message that was sent to you. And then finally, there is the receiver. That is, of course, the person that gets the message, and then there's feedback from the receiver, there's noise, but we're going to kind of ignore that part just for our purposes here tonight, because, uh, of course, we could get into that, but that's going to take way too long. So here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to actually show you how this works and, and give you some examples to help you understand how really this whole thing has been misunderstood from the very beginning by both sides, by both sides. So I'm going to give you an example to help you out here. So let's say the source is back in World War II is the Nazis. And the transmission is the swastika, the Nazi flag. So this is a symbol, means Nazism. We're all familiar with it. And then the receiver of the message would be the Jews. Okay, so what is the encoded message that the Nazis were trying to send? Well, that message would have been, well, we hate the Jews, which, of course, they described, unfortunately, in, in cataclysmic style. And then the decoded message is, we hate the Jews. Okay, no communication hang-ups right here. Now, of course, the message itself is horrible, but there is no miscommunication here. Everybody understands one another. The Nazis are saying, we hate the Jews. The Jews are understanding, unfortunately, loud and clear exactly what that means, and so this is a good example in how a symbol, a flag, could be used as a transmission, a mode to, uh, to communicate a message to somebody, and that's what we're going to use for our purposes tonight. However, this is an example of how that can go wrong. So let's look at post-World War II, where everybody's familiar with the swastika, they know exactly what the swastika means, that's sort of a universal, universally understood symbol now, or is it? Well, what about Buddhist monks? 
Some of you may not realize this, but the swastika, now you'll notice that the swastika is actually backwards from the Nazi swastika, and instead of being askew, in other words, sort of diagonal, it's, it's straight up and down. This is actually a Buddhist symbol for, for peace and has been for many, many years, long before the Nazis co-opted it. And then the receivers, of course, would be the Jews again. So if a Jew post-World War II that is, is aware of the Holocaust were to see a Buddhist monk carrying this around, wearing it on his neck, see a symbol in a temple somewhere, something like that, they might get the message wrong because the Buddhist monk there, what he's trying to communicate with that symbol is, may you have peace. That's what he means by showing that symbol to the world. That is the message that he is broadcasting and projecting by having that symbol on him somewhere or, or around him. But the decoded message from the Jews, if they didn't know that, would understandably be, we hate Jews, because the only time they've ever seen that symbol used, that's the message it was associated with. And so you can see and understand how the message could be misunderstood, that even though the encoder of the message, the source, is putting out what, in his mind, is a very clear and succinct message, even though that is the case, and even though the transmission itself is not quote-unquote bad, the wrong message is being received. And so I think that a very similar thing has happened with what we're, what's going on here, and so I'm going to illustrate here with the rebel flag a similar thing. So if you're looking back in the 1950s, this was when the, the Ku Klux Klan was really sort of taking its reign of terror to a whole new level. And of course, the symbol of transmission, the, the mode of transmission would have been a symbol that they used in the form of the rebel flag. Now, there were people that used this flag that were not associated with the Klan, that didn't mean any kind of harm by it. But let's look at what they meant when they said it this time. And the receiver would have been, of course, the black community. So if you're looking at the encoded message, the encoded message by the Nazis, very similar to the encoded message by the Jews, or sorry, by the uh, Nazis towards the Jews with the swastika, is we hate black people. And the decoded message, we hate black people. Okay, well, you know, that's a horrible message, of course. But the lines of communication are actually working. They mean something by that symbol. And the decoded message that the black community is getting from that symbol is correct. Now, let's fast forward to 1961. So the source in this case would be, and I have the South Carolina capital, but this was actually happening, I'm using South Carolina specifically here, but this was happening in southern capitals, several of them, ironically not Alabama's to a degree, or at least not in a way that you could pin it down correctly. Um, or, or consistently, but we'll just use South Carolina because uh, it's the specific example that was the longest to hold out on this, the longest to not stop doing this, where they started flying the rebel flag over their capital along with the United States flag and their own state flag. Well, of course, the receivers would be the black community again. Now, it's important to note that in 1961, part of the reason that South Carolina and other southern states did this is it was basically a giant middle finger to the black community telling them that they did not support the Civil Rights Act, they did not support the Civil Rights Movement, and this was sort of a intimidation factor may go a little too far, but it was certainly something that was done to communicate that the state did not approve of the actions of the black community and the Civil Rights Movement. So in this one, the encoded message is blacks are inferior. Not quite as strong as we hate black people, but still pretty strong and pretty negative. And because of the association with the Klan, you can understand why the black people would still perceive that message, especially as malicious as it was, as, well, we hate black people. That, that's how they understood the state to be communicating with them while that symbol was present, and that kind of is pretty close to originally what the encoded message actually was, that there were people in the state capitals that wanted to communicate a similar message toward the black community. And, and the reason that they were saying blacks were inferior, of course, is they believed that they had less rights or, or should not have their full so civil rights like white citizens should. Now, let's fast forward to today. And this is important because you have to remember that, especially with people in my generation, 
And I'm not saying this is a brag because we didn't choose this. This was mostly something done by our parents. The vast majority of the kids that I ran into, your average redneck Southern boys, and, and girls, of course, but I'm using guys in this particular scenario just because I am one. Your average child raised even in the South at this time period was not taught all of this. And I remember back when there was the uh, like Southern Pride, Southern Heritage uh, movement, and, and there was a lot of, uh, what was it, Southern Comfort was the the clothing company that did a lot of that stuff. Uh, now you have similar things with the rowdy gentlemen and whatever. So when we saw the rebel flag, the only thing that we ever thought about with that, and I can speak from my own experience, maybe there are people that had somewhat of a different experience, but ultimately the vast majority of the people that I knew of that saw the rebel flag, looked at the rebel flag, they just thought of that as being something of Southern heritage. And then of course the black community, they were taught, something very different because their parents and grandparents actually experienced the civil rights movement. They remember when there were people like the Klan, like their own state governments, unfortunately, that were using this symbol to communicate evil intention to them. And so in this case, you have the encoded message of, I love the South. To most people my age, and actually even a little bit older, that were raised in like the late 80s, early 90s, race relations were not perfect, but they weren't that big of an issue for anybody under a certain age. We never really grew up with that. I mean, we went to school where schools had been desegregated for a really long time. Nobody really thought anything about it. I'm not saying that there was no racism or there were no racist kids in this period, but it was in an extreme, extreme minority. By and large, people just didn't think about that kind of stuff. We just kind of all thought of each other as equals because that's what we were taught. And when it came to the flag, we always just kind of thought of that as being something, hey, I'm, I'm proud of being from a southern state. I, I love my hometown. I, I love where I'm from, and this is a way for me to communicate that. Unfortunately, like I said, though, when it came to the black community, their kids were taught something completely different. Their kids were taught, and reasonably so considering the history, that that symbol means I hate black people, the same thing that they understood it to mean back in the 1950s and 1960s. And so I say all of this and I do this presentation just to help you understand, do you see how in that scenario, there's no malicious intent from either side. Neither the black community, especially the younger black community that didn't grow up in the, the civil rights era, that didn't grow up in the 50s and 60s and don't remember when there were people doing that, doing public Klan displays where they were carrying around the rebel flag, that's not something that they were aware of or, or knew either. But they knew that their parents would point that out and say, well, you know, that's who those people are. And in their experience, normally the people that did fly that flag those people were white supremacists, a lot of them. And they really did want to hurt them. They really did want to keep them from having their full civil rights. But the kids of my generation that were just raised Southern, we weren't taught any of that. We didn't know any of that. To us, that symbol always just meant I'm really proud to be from somewhere south of the Mason-Dixon line. And I am. And so what happens in that situation when you put those elements together, and I know that took a really long time, but I think it's necessary to really digest and understand where everyone is coming from. What that really gives you is one guy on one side that is, you know, maybe wearing a rebel flag t-shirt or has the bumper sticker on his car, and he can't understand why every black kid he runs across despises that because he doesn't mean it that way. He's never been taught that it meant that. None of those things. And then, through no fault of their own, the black kids see it and they see somebody that, that hates them and doesn't like them and thinks of them as inferior. And that's because that's what they've been taught their whole life. And so, same symbol, but completely different message encoding and decoding. And because of that, you get very different sentiments 
from the symbol than what was intended. And when that happens, not only do you have, obviously, because the wrong message is being understood, the black people that, that see that, not only do you have them being wildly offended, and you can understand why, but then when they push back on it, then all of a sudden the white kid that wears the symbol that didn't mean it that way gets offended because you're accusing him of being a racist. I mean, that's one of the most terrible things that you can accuse a person of. And I think that that's correct. That is one of the worst things that a person can be. But you've just accused him of that even though he never intended anything like that. And see, so do you see how you could have two perfectly reasonable, rational people that meant absolutely no harm towards one another all of a sudden at each other's throats? I think that the solution here, when you've got two sides that are both understandably upset and both had no malice toward one another going into this situation, that I think that the only solution here is to extend as much grace and benefit of the doubt to the other side as possible. To be calm and to be patient and to assume that the other person isn't a bad guy. Then when all of a sudden a black person gets wildly offended at you having that symbol either on you or on your truck or, or whatever, that you extend as much grace to him as possible and understand that that's, you know, that's just what he was taught growing up his whole life. In the same way, the other direction, that when the black kid sees the, the white kid with the, the, the rebel flag sticker, that he doesn't assume automatically that the guy is a white nationalist that wants to kill every black person he meets. We should do that, which is wise, and it's part of the reason that I don't really use the symbol anymore. It's because it's too much trouble, it might offend people, and you know what, there, there's better symbols out there to use anyway. And there was a sermon that was preached by Brother Brent Misseldine, who, by the way, is the preacher up at the, cha uh, the, the Prattville Church of Christ and a good friend of mine. And uh, he actually did a, a guest speaking sermon one time that I was in attendance to, and he made a fantastic point about how Paul especially made some accommodations for people that he didn't have to do all for the sake of making it easier for him to talk to and relate to his fellow brothers in Christ. And there's even a verse that he alluded to where Paul is talking about uh, in Romans the, the sacrifice of meat to idols and what laws are acceptable and not acceptable when you can't eat certain meats and not other meats, which is something that Christians aren't really familiar with today, but back then it was a big deal because you had a lot of Jewish Christians that were debating over whether or not they had to keep the dietary laws or not. And Paul basically answered with, okay, the, the Greek Christians here are actually right. You don't have to adhere to those things, but it would be something that violates a person's conscience. And because of that, if I have to never eat meat again to keep my brother from stumbling, I will do it. That is an outpouring of love. That is a willingness to say, even though it may cost me something, if it helps my brother get to heaven, I'll do whatever it takes. I mean, is that not the attitude that we should all reflect? I don't think that it's morally wrong, especially considering that there were a lot of people of my generation that were raised thinking that the flag means nothing other than Southern heritage and I'm proud to be from the South. I don't think there's anything morally wrong with using the flag to that, and I would not assume that anybody that was using the flag as a symbol to, to decorate their home or something like that was doing something wrong. I don't think that that's correct. But what I will add and what I will say is, maybe that's something that we need to think about in the way that Paul did. If it's something that's causing problems, if it's something that's going to be a hindrance or a hurdle to spreading the gospel or communicating the love of Christ to another person, maybe we got to reconsider whether or not that is something that is worth being used here. See, because there's times where when we offend one another, it's worth it. The gospel offends people all the time. If you tell somebody that is neck deep in postmodernist thinking, and you tell them that there is an objective truth and there is a right and wrong, that's going to offend them. 
but you still have to tell them. This, I don't think you can make the case that it's something that you need to hang on to real tight. And I don't convict anybody that uses the symbol if, as long as it's not motivated by any kind of malice or, or malcontent in their heart for their brother. But I do have to question their wisdom in continuing to do that, knowing that it may hurt their ability to talk to others about Christ. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, Woke Brigade.